there we are. So now we are officially recording. Um, the only faces that will appear are the panelists, so you do not have to worry about that. Um, and then if you want to view this webinar later at your own leisure, you will be able to. We will be uploading it on the Tannenbaum and the Network for Religious and Traditional Peacemakers YouTube channels and social media channels. So thank you again. Um, before we begin, I'd like to welcome you all, first of all, to this event presented both by us at the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding and in partnership with the Network for Religious and Traditional Peacemakers. Um, before I move on to introducing the panel, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Rachel Palermo, to introduce the Network for Religious and Traditional Peacemakers. Rachel, go ahead. Thank you so much. And thank you all so much for being with us here today. I wanna to give you a little bit of information about our network. The Network for Religious and Traditional Peacemakers builds bridges between grassroots peacemakers and global actors to support the positive role of religious and traditional actors in peace building processes. We are a global network of over 100 members and supporters representing an array of actors, including inter and intra-governmental agencies, academic institutions, international and national organizations, faith-based organizations, and religious and traditional peacemakers, including women and youth. Our priorities as a network are to empower local peacemakers, to strengthen the leadership of women and youth in religious and traditional peacemaking, as well as broader peacebuilding processes, to support the positive role of religious and traditional leaders and actors in preventing violence, and also to provide opportunities for these actors to help shape international policy frameworks. To learn more about the network, I invite you to explore our website, which I will link in the chat. I will also leave my email in the chat for those who may be interested in learning more about how to become a member or a supporter. Over to you, Ellie. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so I will introduce the Tannenbaum Center. Tannenbaum Center for Religious Understanding is a secular, non-sectarian nonprofit that works to promote religious peace builders who help counter extremism and violence in armed conflicts, but also tackles the religious bullying of students, harassment in workplaces, and disparate health treatment for people based on their beliefs. So we are based in New York. Um, the program that I work in and that um, my friend here, Sarah, has, is a part of is our Peacemakers in Action Network. Uh, we convene a network of religiously motivated peace builders working in conflict and post-conflict zones. Uh, we've named this network the Peacemakers in Action Network, and I'm very happy to see that Sarah has joined us today. Um, it's a network of 29 living peacemakers from 23 different conflict zones, and I will also be leaving more information in the chat for anyone who's interested about learning more. So before we begin, um, I will introduce our panel, and then I will hand it over to our moderator. So our moderator today is Dr. Hulu Katib. Um, she is from Lebanon, and she is the co-founder and president of Louder, a human rights organization that's established in Beirut. She has thorough experience in the international legal framework of women's rights, gender-based violence, women's empowerment, women's political participation, and the role of women in conflict prevention. One of our speakers today is Sarah Ahmed, who I just mentioned. She is the doctor of program. Uh, she's the director of program operations at Preemptive Love Coalition in Iraq. She's been a Tannenbaum peacemaker in action since 2017. So she's an expert in sustainable economic development and job creation for youth and women. She's been on the peacemaking path for now over 17 years. Um, her current programs focus on entrepreneurial development and women's empowerment through the development of sustainable small and micro businesses to change economic landscapes in Iraq, the Middle East region and Latin America most recently. Um, next up, we have Thuraya Bakur, who is an education specialist, strategist and a corporate image management consultant. She's been working for leading educational institutions in the Middle East for two decades. She's a firm believer in human rights and has, worked, um, has ran projects for UNICEF, UNDP, the Lebanese Red Cross. And today she will actually be representing Tastakel, uh, a Syrian women's organization for which she has served on the board of for 10 years. Uh, following that is Sister Veronica Onyanisi from Nigeria. She is a missionary sister of Our Lady of Apostles, <clears throat> and she works as the executive director of the Women's Interfaith Council in Nigeria. Sister Veronica is an administrator, an educator, a social and grassroots promoter, and a developmental worker. She's involved in interreligious dialogue and peace building processes in Nigeria, and she's passionate about working with women and youth of faith groups and promoting interreligious dialogue. Finally, Mr. Koulibaly is the founder, president, and CEO of the Global Institute for Women's Empowerment Group in Mali. He's an economist, a strategist, and a social entrepreneur, entrepreneur committed to the global economic progress and sustainable development. Um, Kasum has more than 21 years of working experience with youth and women across Africa and across the world. 
And now he's dedicated his life to the promotion of and the protection of human rights, women's rights, gender equality, and the empowerment of women all around the world. So that is our panel for today. Before I hand it along to our moderator, um, I will remind everyone in the chat that the chat is open. So please feel free to introduce yourselves. Tell us where you're tuning in from. Tell us what you do. Um, tell us what your interest in today's subject is. And feel free to use the Q&A feature, which is enabled and will stay enabled throughout the entire discussion. So Hulud, if you're ready, up to you. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Thank you so much. I would like to welcome everyone. It's an honor to be with you today uh, with the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding and a Network for Religious and Traditional Peacemaker. It's an honor to be moderating today with this inspiring peace, peacemaker discussing such an important topic of women and young women of faith advancing economic development. This is a very important topic. If we want to link it to the theme of this year that everybody's focusing on achieving gender equality and empowerment of all the women and the girls in the context of a climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction policies and a program which remains one of the greatest global challenges in the 21th century. Because till now, women are being increasingly being recognized as the most vulnerable to climate changes impacts than men. Although many, many women have been involved in many sustainability initiatives around the world and their participation and leadership results in many effectiveness and effective tools for climate actions. It is very important for us today to examine the opportunities, the challenges, but also the solutions that we need of how and the importance of empowering women and girls to have voice and to be equal players in the decision-making related for the essentials of sustainable development and, and greater gender equality. Because we understand that without gender equality today, a sustainable future and equal future remon remains beyond our reach. And I am sure that all of us and many, many, many of us maybe have faced a lot of stereotypes but this is how uh, strong women respond to stereotypes, by going through our way, by showing leadership, by excelling in the field when they get the opportunities that they really deserve. Having women in leadership position should become the norm and not the exception. It matters to our quality of decision-making. It matters to our daughter, to our future generation, not only for women, but for all of us. And this is how when we imagine a gender equal world, a world that is free from bias, free from stereotype, free from discrimination, a world that is filled and of diversity, of, equitable, of being equitable, of being inclusive, a world where diversity is really valued and celebrated. That's why maybe I call everyone on this year to raise our theme and break the bias against the woman. So, Today, it's important to see the importance of investing in women empowerment and how much it's, it has a Im beneficial impact on peace and prosperity. A lot of analysis around the world have shown how improving gender equality can raise economic growth, can enhance financial stability, and make societies more resistant to violence and conflict. Pointing out to women and girls as being powerful agents of change can help societies transform themselves from fragile states into stable nation. And I guess it's important today on this occasion to change our narratives that we women are recipients of aid and victims of conflicts. We women are peace builders, are peacemakers, are women who are really building their communities. That's why we need to recognize the contribution of these women today and know their initiatives. And I would like to welcome all the panelists today, Dr. Sara, Suraya, Sister Veronica, and Kasum. I'm very, um, I'm very honored to be moderating the session with you today. And I would like to learn from your successful initiative, from your successful uh, um, experiences all over the, the region and all over the world. So we would like to start by Sarah and then move to Suraya and Sister Veronica and then Kasum. And we'll take, so we'll have like a series of questions that we're moderating among, uh, to listen from your experiences. And we'll have Sarah about three to four minutes to tell us about uh, your 17 years of path in, in peace building. 
and being being awarded the Peacemaker Award. So tell us like, how have you been shaping and impacting your local economics to meet the needs of women and young women? And how do you see the connection of women empowerment and peace building? The floor is yours. And we have like around four minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Khaloud. Thanks for everybody who joined and uh, for the other panelists uh, as well. Honored to be among uh, all of you and among all these experience. I know that I'd be leaving with a lot of knowledge as well. I'll be learning as well as uh, as from our, our uh, attendees and also from our amazing panelists. Um, so uh, to start with like, and this is something that I've, economy in links to like uh, gender equality and then to peace building have been like a, a passion of mine and it's something that did not happen to me like all of the sudden it took some it took some like some work um starting with relief with the initiative with a small initiative with the youth and educational development and and then deep down like in the past 10 years i was uh, I felt uh, strongly about the fact that peace building actually comes from economical development. And um, the fact that we can actually build change makers um, if we are empowering the economy. And of course, empowering the women uh, to empower the economy and it, it like and it lessen the gender gap little by little. Um, the, the, what what I am what I am involved in what I do is consist of a lot of layers and uh, layer by layer it leads to the last one which is peacemaking and I think that what what we uh, have uh, unfolded and, and, and uh, realized uh, in in empowering economy is that first of all we need to listen to listen to the local economy listen to the need of the people listen to the communities that we are actually involving ourselves in first of all like. The, 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 of course, it will be different from one, one of us, one person to another, from one experience to another. But for my experience, I have always targeted disadvantaged communities. And those that are disadvantaged communities, even if I don't want to call them like this, but just for contextual um, knowledge, uh, like IDPs, refugees, uh, host communities, and communities that are actually struggling because of added added uh, struggles, um, are, are uh, like I would have classified them under, under um, disadvantaged communities. So the first step and the first layer of that is to actually get involved, identify those community, listen to those communities and listen to the need and what can, how does the economy, like the shaping of economy looks inside those small communities in the context of a bigger like ecosystem of uh, like the general communities where we are in a city, country, etc. It grows, like it starts small from the grassroots and it grows. Um, and, and exploring the idea like we like I have always invested in exploring the idea of reviving the local economy and within within the individual of that local economy. So even if we are targeting certain number of um, of individual within a community, we are actually linking them as well to their local counterparts. We are we are we do not uh, like I I don't believe in like separating and kind of like. Um, isolating uh, certain certain people because they are the people that we are working with on the contrary actually an immersive program of people who are learning and people who have actually been through that and had the lesson learned and that in a way um, was through like, and I have an amazing team, of course, like this is not an individual effort. My amazing team, some of them are actually are part of the attendees. Like we listen, we hear the needs, we create connection, we create entrepreneurship circles where people are learning from each other. Um, and then we do, we do um, the, the development that we are looking at, which is mostly sustainable development when it comes to like a small a micro and small uh, business development. And, and within that, um, we actually identify the fact that uh, there is a big, big gender gap when it comes to economy and empowerment of economy. Um, the, the in general, um, economy is, is have been a male dominated sector and uh, uh, like sustainable development it have been also a male dominated sector. But we always, um, we always what, what I try to do is always in bring in 
um, bring in as much as possible of um, female leaders or female uh, uh, possible leadership of households and and uh, invite them into a different idea, invite them into the possibilities of what they actually can achieve if they were empowered, like if they were empowered uh, economy wise uh, by leading their own businesses, by like being introduced in the work so, uh, in the workforce, of course. Like when I work, what I come from is actually individually led businesses. So it's my own business. I want to lead it, and I want to be empowered to lead my business. Um, the second lane, layer is is actually the is to close the gender gap and by by introducing, as I said, the women into the workforce and into the flourish into the flourishing economy, or for them being part of that. Um, in my humble experience, I noticed that women hold the biggest load in general when it comes to taking care of the family in a crisis during war. Um, they are the most subjected to violence um, and 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 within the family and within the actual community as well. And I, I realized little by little, if uh, like if we help women rises and if women actually are able to overcome, uh, they, they kind of like tear, take their account, like take their um, community with them. Um, we, we noticed that the community is actually rising as well. And, and to kind of like, and I don't want, um, to confuse everybody, but like to link it back to peacemaking, I think there is a massive linkage between that and to, between uh, like sustainable development and sustainable income because that's what we are trying to achieve, right? So when we are creating uh, uh, like a, a business for someone, uh, we are actually uh, having empowering them economically where they have sustainable income, a very earnable income as well. So they are making uh, the money and the bread for their families. And that reduces the violence by like extremely. Um, if it's uh, uh, reducing it through, um, if it's reducing it, uh, because there are so many forms of violence, right? And if we are reducing it by on the, like on a family level or actually community level, um, it, it's, been, it's been linked, uh, it's been linked to their uh, welfare and um, to their income, um, we through through the model as well that we're, like I have introduced, which is like coaching and um, continuous intervention within the communities as well to support them through the process of um, you know flourishing economically. Um, we actually build peacemaking through talking about it, through introduction and making people, making sure that young women and female and young women and women who are head of household know that they actually have a voice that they can use. Um, they can stop the violence in their own way. And that in a way help in little by little into kind of like putting all the pieces together in the peace building exercise, I would say. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Sarah. And I love like how your passion has motivated your initiatives, how you have a lot of inclusive approach and bringing everybody's voice when you listen, when you hear, when you connect, when you create, when you learn and you do, not only as an individual, but also as a team. And this is so inspiring when we, when, when we include everybody within the community. So we'd love to, to move from Dr. Sarah and to you, Theraya, and learn from your experience, especially that you've been involved in education and education like is very important pillar when we come to link between empowerment and education. So we'd like to hear in four to five minutes from your experience of have you been also impacting your local communities and when you can tell us about this um, relationship between this education empowerment and peace building. The floor is hey, yours. Me, um, I'm so pleased to be amongst all of you uh, guys, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm very happy to see uh, that we have a, a very nice crowd to talk to, to preach, to, to tell our stories to. But let me start by saying that what I'm doing right now is not usually my job. I am the strategist, the voice of reason. I'm the image manager. I'm the person who says, do that and don't do that. And I follow the reason. The passion is usually hence domain. 
but Hind happens to be on a plane right now. So she told me I have to do this. I'm very passionate about it. I'm not good at, uh, as Hind is in uh, remembering all the details, but I can tell you with uh, uh, very simple words, uh, the story of Tastaqal. Let me start with the name. The name means, and then she became independent. That's what our name, that's our name in Arabic. She became independent. And it all started when a group of women living in Canada, led by Hind, and uh, any of you who knows Hind knows how passionate she is about things she does and about when she wants to enlist you, she doesn't allow you to say no. At the beginning of the crisis in Syria, uh, there was this, there's need for help. Somebody needs to travel. Somebody needs to take uh, stuff down to the people who are in dire need. They're leaving their houses. There's uh, refugees, there's IDPs. Uh, so we all started as a group of women led by uh, the idea of two uh, ladies, Syrian Canadian ladies at the time, started by taking aid, humanitarian aid to Syria. Then, uh, you know, due to the conflict in Syria, we realized that there is a large, huge number of families that consisted now of only women and children. Men were either at war or uh, they were detained, uh, missing, uh, dead, later we discovered. Uh, and uh, due to the nature of society in Syria, uh, we started by uh, giving aid and we started by small projects. Like, uh, like uh, uh, Dr. Sarah said, uh, all these disadvantaged people that uh, had no opportunities, needed to learn a certain craft, needed to be introduced to the work market, we availed a lot of little initiatives to teach uh, women uh, ways that they could earn uh, income for their families. Uh, we moved to education because we realized there's a much bigger gap. People who come from the Levant, like me and Dr. Khulud, realized that even though we're a very patriarchal society, we come from a place that traditionally, historically dependent on trade, which means most of the time, uh, men were not at home. They were somewhere else. So the women are actually a lot more powerful than the society gives them credit for. All their power are taken when there is crisis, but in normal mode, the women are given a lot more than traditional societies. They're given education, they're given income, they are giving uh, a, a comfortable life. We realized there's a huge number of Syrian women who were very well educated, extremely well educated, but who have never ever in their lives entered the workforce because they weren't expected to. They were expected to be wives, take care of the family, stay at home. We had lawyers, very good lawyers. We had very good doctors. We had very good uh, economists. We had uh, a lot of people who uh, had very high education, but they didn't know how to use it. Uh, obviously, after the trauma they were through, uh, it was even more difficult for them to remember that persona, that university student who knew too much and who was very good at what she studied and at what she does before she became a full-time mom. So uh, uh, we also realized that women are a lot uh, better in making peace if the gentleman will allow me. They don't hold on to their anger as long as uh, men do. So we shifted from serving the very less uh, the less privileged and to trying to avail opportunities and uh, professional development for these very capable women to join the workforce as a start to provide a higher level of income for their uh, uh, families wherever they are be it they are in, in uh, IDPs inside Syria or if they were in Turkey or uh, we had a few pro uh, a project in uh, Jordan uh, we started uh, an initiative to teach and empower particularly women uh, to be able to play a critical role in uh, the peace process. We wanted more women at the table uh, in negotiations and the creation of local, uh, 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 you know, the local councils in Northern Syria. 
So we offered programs. Uh, I'm going to talk about just the last two. We've been in action for around uh, five or six years now. We've offered multiple programs that change according to the need. Our last two programs are called Engendering Democracy, uh, Democracy Through Growth Inequality and Interfaith Dialogue for Empowering and Advancing Society. So they are different in nature. Our, our offerings uh, change depending on the need of the uh, group we are catering to. We offer critical thinking and conflict re resolution, and we open, uh, we seek to open doors for women who uh, are with us to be heard internationally. So to go to venues and to things like the United Nations on behalf of the Syrian women, on behalf of the peace talks. We also offer nonviolence. We offer psychosocial support uh, at, a, at a more, at a broader level. We uh, offer advocacy training so that women can advocate for their own rights. We've moved heavily in the past year and a half into uh, uh, fighting gender-based violence and inequality through uh, uh, promoting the laws, through creating campaigns. We also offer international and humanitarian law, trans transitional justice, uh, public speaking, governance uh, and elections, and uh, capacity building in general, how to run a small project, how to join the workforce. So if we talk about women's economic empowerment in terms of women's ability to succeed and advance economically, then we have used education as, Tastaqil uh, uh, has used education as the way uh, to empower the women economically by acquiring the right skills and resources to compete in the markets. We wanted uh, those very capable, very educated women to have a voice to, or actually to raise their voices because we discovered most of them had a very strong voice, but they've never used it before. They, the, the, traditionally, uh, nobody expected them to use it and they kind of forgot it. So uh, we wanted, uh, we are empowering women to gain equal access to jobs and uh, to gain power to make and act on economic and peacemaking decisions. Uh, because we believe women are capable in building, are critical in building lasting peace. I'm not good in time. Tell me if I'm over time. Yeah, well, maybe we'll come in another round to you. So thank you so much. And thank you for rela relating the capability of women with uh, with how to challenge with how to defeat all the challenges that we have in the community that women could be empowered to to increase their skills and not only to have voice but this voice can impact the community and advocate for their not only for their rights but maybe the rights of the whole community and involving in community i would like to move to you sister veronica especially with your intensive experience in interreligious dialogue and peace building and like you've been a lot working with women and youth of faith promoting interreligious dialogue. So we'd like to hear from your experience with all these years of path about like this importance of connection of women empowerment and peace building from your perspective. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are listening. Um, here in Nigeria, Kaduna, uh, Kaduna has been a conflict community for a long time. And that's what gave rise to our organization, Interfaith Forum of Muslim and Christian Women's Association, popularly known as Women's Interfaith Council. Um, the organization began to create a platform for Muslims and Christians to come together in peaceful dialogue and uh, issues that concern the women um, to build trust among Christians and Muslims because religion was used by some of the political um, elites to divide the community. And uh, as time went on, um, we started building trust among the 
Christians and Muslims, telling the society that Christians and Muslims can work together, can live together in peace. And um, because there's no way economic empowerment of women can flourish in an environment that is not peaceful, in an environment that does not favor women, that does not enable women. And um, the Women's Interfaith Council now started pursuing the rights of women and young women for an improved equitable society. And um, young women are faced with complex development changes and at the same time cannot make a decision to tackle these challenges due to the culture they find themselves. And um, Women's Interfaith Council try to bring education to educate the women, to educate the public on uh, respecting the rights of women in the society. And we do this through the capacity building training. We also have a um, um, radio program, which we time listen and let her voice be heard, where we talk about issues that concern women and young girls and educating the people. We also um, go carry out advocacy program we to traditional leaders, religious leaders, because we notice that we cannot do it alone. The women cannot do it alone. It's true that women champion their cause, but they need their male counterparts to achieve this. And they need the traditional leaders and religious leaders who stand out in the society to support them, to respect the rights of women, to educate women, to educate young girls. In our society, uh, Nigeria, you find out that um, male child are preferred to girl child. The girl child, they feel their education ends in the kitchen at home. So the male child can attend any highest education in the society. Because of this, a uh, girl child is given out a marriage at early age of 12, 13 years without any education. So we educate women's interfaith council have been carrying out um, enlightenment programs to tell the society that education of a girl is as important as education of a boy, a boy. And this has been yielding fruits because we have girls now that go to school, even after marriage, they still enroll into uh, education, which has uh, empowered most of them. We also have a skill acquisition for those of them who could not go into um, um, four walls of school. They, get this skill acquisition to empower them. Because we find out that for a woman to have voice in the society, she needs to be economically empowered. That economical empowerment, we give her voice in the society to support the family, to train her children, which gives her that dignity in the society, even in her home. And it brings peace in the, in the family too. Because more, when a woman depends on the husband for every down thing for the family, it's always causing conflict. And the trainings we have given them have yielded uh, a lot that su success stories have been told on how um, it has helped them to regain their dignity at home that their husbands can now respect them because they can make contribution in the home. They can send their children to school without depending on their husband. We also have, a, and with that too, women can participate in decision-making because if you don't have voice, how will you participate? We are in a society where men decide on what happens. 
So we encourage women, we educate them and help them to participate in decision-making. We create a, a platform, the trainings we do, we enable them to participate. Initially, when we bring the male and female together in our trainings, most of them, the women feel shy to talk. But as time goes on, we en encourage them to talk. And you find that they, they have a lot of things to offer, which men is now appreciating. And we also encourage the traditional rulers to involve women in their councils. Like the last training we had two weeks ago, the traditional leader said they have only one woman in their council. I said, what a woman out of 15, what will he do? So we encourage them to involve more women in the council and that will help in decision taking because women have to be there to decide on what happens to them not men deciding on our issue for us. And politically too, we find out when you come to the Northwest, here in the Northwest, you find that we have only one woman in the Senate. She is in the House of Representative in Kaduna. And in other seven states, she's the only woman representing us. And we organize seminars like uh, last week, Thursday, we had a program that we call Bring, we brought women who have succeeded in politics to educate other women, to tell them what it entails, to serve as a motivator, as mentors to them to come into politics, because we need more women in politics to take decisions for us. Thank you uh, so much, Veronica. Uh, thank you so much. Sorry, second, we also give a skill acquisition training to them. Like when we finish training them in skill acquisition, we give them capital to start off their business and we monitor them. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's very inspiring when you talk about how human rights starts from the dignity from our houses, the importance of getting everyone to support the woman as a whole community. And from this, maybe you raise the voice about the importance of men as being supportive to, wom to women, uh, because like women rights are universal rights. And it's very good that we have um, uh, an, an inspiring peace builder who is a believer in human rights, who is supportive for women rights in us with the panel to tell us about your perspective and your experience being a man, being supportive for this universal cause to hear from you. And we have up to four minutes, Kasum. The floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, my sister and the friend Kulut. I met you seven years ago in yeah. Morocco where we were discussing how we can bring a, a free society with, uh, uh, you know, uh, liberty and freedom for all in the world and you remember i was in that time thinking how i can impact the world especially in africa and as a man i think that uh, being a part of the congress debate from the beijing conference in 1995 so in the declaration of beijing uh, with the beijing declaration and all of the plan of action he said that men uh, should be part of the solution, not uh, to compete with women. And from that side, I've been involved in so many initiatives in the women's economic empowerment. And uh, in, nine, in 2018, the same year we met, I was being awarded by UN Women as Global Champion for Women's Economic Empowerment. And I have developed a kind of uh, competency by uh, expertise of engaging more men and boys in the conversation in Africa and in the world. And I consider my work not only as a technical profession, I consider my work as a faith mission, as a religious mission, because I am a Muslim. And my name is Kasum. Kasum is the first name of the first son of the Prophet Muhammad with Khadija. And I think that being a Muslim is a part of my life and the part of my engagement to bring peace you know, in the world and to bring, you know, uh, gender equality as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu did. And for doing that, my mother in spirit as Khadija, okay, was the first empowered woman. 
So if I want to work in that the world, I need a model. And that model of empowered woman is my mother, Khadija. So I want to talk about the first initiative in the world called the Khadija Initiative that want to bring you know, peace by food and food for peace, okay? Because with a population with hunger, we cannot bring any peace in the world. And especially in Africa, we are about uh, 2 billion people in Africa and half of the population is 1 billion. And Muslim in Africa are about 500 million. And among 500 million of Muslim in Africa, we have about 250 uh, you know, a million uh, of women and young women who are in Africa. So this is a population, a, a very important population where we need to work with to support you know, the growth of Africa to fight for uh, gender equality, but also to fight for peace and sustainable development. I am coming from Mali. You know now in Mali, in Sahel region, we are in the very, very challenging peace and security uh, time, where in my country we have two coups and in one year, and we are trying to struggle to bring peace. And women are part of the solution because of the resolution 30, uh, 25 of the United Nations, all Muslims should be part of the conversation to bring peace in our societies and for sustainable development at all. And what are the challenges we are in now in Africa? You know that I said that there is a lot of cultural issues where our gender norms and the gender practice with the patriarchy history are you know letting a lot of women behind the, 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 the progress of the society. And with women are facing with TBV, you know, harmful practices, FGM, you know, every part in Africa, and especially in West Africa, and especially in the Muslim communities. We are also so many uh, challenges we are facing uh, about the coordination of our actors. It can be so also. We come, yeah, we will come to these challenges uh, yeah, on the okay. second round. But would, is there any important thing that you like to yes. focus about yes. Uh, yes. in one minute, please? We'll come in a second round for the challenges. But if you want okay. to highlight okay. just one initiative from your own perspective in one minute, and then we'll come back to the challenges. Okay. Uh, so just uh, what I want to, to, to say in one minute, that we, said that we have developed a kind of pilot initiative for Khadija Initiative in four pillars where we are now bringing all Muslim women in agriculture to support peace and development in the, the continent. And that's what example that we are doing that is shown a lot of solution and results that women can be part of the solution. When we bring women in producing food, they can be able to sustain the population. They can be able to bring education. They will be able to bring SRHR initiative in their communities and we can have peace for all. That I can say from now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so so much for um, for all your inspiring initiatives and uh, your Hike, inspiring talk, Kasum. And we'll go back to you, Sara. And we know that both of us come from region in the MENA region, where we face a lot of challenges, uh, a lot of conflicts. Uh, me, for me, for example, in Lebanon, who is facing like the largest breakdown our country have ever faced at many different levels. So uh, moving up to the empowerment of women and the voice of a woman is being faced by a lot of barriers. Uh, for me, I want to hear from you. How do you see like the real barriers of where faith actors and their community in advancing the women's leadership in their participations of the economy? What are the real barriers that, that you see and how are these barriers being addressed? But we'll like to round up a little bit because we've taken a lot in round one and maybe in two minutes, please, because like we need to hear a lot and many other um, ideas. So if you would like for two to three minutes maximum, please. Of course, thank you so much. I would like to hear as well. So I'll, I'll try to be as succinct as possible. Um, so 
there is many, many, many challenges on on uh, on different levels. Uh, but if we want to talk about the kind of like the religious aspect and the cultural aspect of of that barriers, I think that the especially in some of the communities that we have been uh, like uh, I, uh, we are trying to attack or trying to kind of like tackle um, holding up the cultural and the religious values and the misinterpretation of certain beliefs as well about women and about their abilities have been some of the like um, most uh, like make, like most uh, heavy uh, challenge that we were um, faced with and we are trying to deal with uh, the fact that women in certain cultures uh, and um, I'm not saying it in any like if this does that my speech does not have any bad connotations I'm, I'm just being honest about the challenge and um, like the fact that some women in certain cultures women in certain cultures and in some of the areas that we are actually working in um, have to kind of like work harder uh, to actually establish anything to be present to actually a voice if, if if they actually remember that they have a voice to actually voice their opinion and voice their presence um, imagine now we are taking all of that obstacle and uh, like um, actually applying it to another area of difficulties, which is a male dominated sector, which is economy and economic and development and economy development. So, and, and the, and the challenge to for a, a female being a, like a woman being a, of a certain gender, combating all of that and being present and actually running a business, that's one of the biggest challenges that we actually been um, trying to combat. Um, some of the areas that we actually work on, uh, work in, are also have uh, with the complexity of the culture and the religious values and upholding that, upholding those, there is also the tribalism that we need to also respect and honor uh, while actually uh, trying to inflict change and, and build peace. Um, so this is, uh, this challenge have been the biggest in closing the gender gap when it comes to women, um, women um, empowerment, uh, like economical empowerment for women. Um, some of the, some of the better ways of actually uh, trying to kind of break in those barriers wa was to reach out, reach out, listen to those community, listen to these concerns, try to show and lead by example, uh, try to support and provide as much of empowerment as possible to women leaders or women, um, you know, entrepreneurs, local entrepreneurs who actually would like to kind of like uh, have the ability to show up, but they are scared or or they are uh, afraid or uh, they are being a challenge with all those obstacles. Um, this is one like and and in a way like we are uh, uh, building up uh, building on like empowered women empower women. So we are trying to kind of like build a, a, a chain where like uh, people supporting each other. Uh, we are talking here about like women but actually we have a lot of also uh, male entrepreneurs who are actually supporting their the female or entrepreneurs in their community as well. So this is kind of like some of the biggest challenges that have been um, that we have been facing in, in in this sector. Thank you, Dr. Sara. So Suraya, Sara uh, highlighted a lot of important barriers like male-dominated economy, the religious values, misinterpretation of them, the culture, maybe tribalism but also offer the importance of the listen and educated people. What would you like to what Sarah adds if we want to highlight the barriers, especially in the MENA? You're muted. You're muted, Thuraya. Um, I'm and going to discuss it. Oh, I will try, oh, I'm <laughs> going to try my best. So I'm uh, going specifically to talk about how faith becomes a major uh, actor when you are in a conflict or in hardship. So everybody re resorts to faith. So we in Tastaqil found that we needed to enlist uh, the uh, help of faith actors specifically because a lot of our uh, target groups actually uh, needed their faith workers, to, to their faith uh, representatives to tell them that what they're doing is right and then they need to be, keep going and that uh, it is uh, within their 
rights and within uh, their uh, role to, to seek employment, to seek being part of the political process, to seek help, to represent their families, to fight for their families. We, uh, we understand that they, there are uh, less, uh, there is less access to assets and services for women in general. But in the case, particular case of Syri uh, Syrian refugees, uh, it became women seeking access in a country that's not theirs and in circumstances that they're not used to. Uh, most of the times where the language spoken, like in the case of Turkey, was not a language they understand very easily, and they had to learn a language on top of seeking work. So we needed to enlist faith workers who are uh, just like us. They are people uh, who, who contain, uh, who, they're a group of people who have a lot of uh, uh, actors who believe in the rights of women, who want women to advance. We wanted them to uh, adjust the social norms. Uh, to tell that the traditional role of unpaid care work provided by women had to be set aside because now the woman is also the care uh, and the income provider for uh, the family. We wanted them to uh, remove the stigma or to enlighten the stigma around gender-based violence. Because you know, if two men get uh, if two men get into a fight, it's an honor story to tell. But if a woman gets uh, harassed in a workplace on a, in a difficult situation, it's a story to hide. So we enlisted. Uh, we had great people helping us to tell that no, there's uh, the mistake is the mistake of the attacker, and the woman had to write the right to seek education, to help their families, to build better futures uh and uh to build peace and to seek better situations uh so uh, uh in fighting extremism basically i think we need to enlist faith workers in fighting the the people who use extremism and use faith as a way to put women down thank you Thuraya, and move to you sister veronica an importance of like the challenges Thuraya highlights for the role of faith actors I guess, I mean, this is very important challenges of how can they impact the community? How would you like to add for the challenges that were addressed by Sarah and Soraya, Sister Veronica? Some of the challenges we encounter is uh, indigenous uh, cultural and harmful practices. Um, and some of these practices are backed up with religious tests such as uh, Puda, Puda, which we call in Aousa Kule, where women are inside the house, they don't carry out any activity, they don't do anything. And most of them don't like this, but because they use a uh, religion to back it up and it hinders the leadership position of women. Also, even in decision-making, some of them are just in there. They cannot participate in taking decision. They cannot. Hmm. Sister Veronica, can you hear us? I think she has problem with the internet, right? Okay, until she fixes her internet, I would like to move to you, Kasum. And we know like Mali has been facing a lot of challenges. And I mean, what kind of, of barriers that you've been addressing in your first round to tell us among facing regarding, Sister Veronica, can you hear us? So sorry, <laughs> my connection went off. Okay. Would you like you to add me? a final statement for the challenges before I move to Kasum? Because the time is running out. Okay, I guess she has a technical problem. So tell us, Kasum, about like main barriers, especially to hear from you from Mali's uh, context. Yes, uh, this first barrier. Uh, Are you uh, hearing me? This challenge I want to highlight is about uh, uh, in some religions and most of the religions who are religious leaders, but also are backed by, by patriarchy. Uh, they cannot able to take off.
of this patriarchy position in their own lives when instead of, of their uh, in as their religious leader this is the first barrier for me that's something we need to highlight the second thing is the uh, coordination of faith leaders we are not only muslim in mali we have christians and we have also traditional faiths also but religious leaders are not working together to see the same direction and how to support globally the women in their communities. They are working for Muslims are working their side, you know, Christians are working their side, and the traditional leaders, you know, faith leaders are working their side. So this lack of coordination is something we, I know. That we are not we need to, to have at the second challenge. The third challenge is the religious leaders don't have the abilities and the capacities as gender experts. If you are hearing me let how they can analyze the gender situation of a country with the technical skills, skills and tools and frameworks that we as human rights activists first we use, okay? And they are just using, you know, the faith knowledge, but not mix it with uh, the gender you know, expertise. I think that this is a third challenge that's very important uh, in our community to see. But the last thing is access to education. Because the way we educate our young women in the development and peace building process is something very critical area where we want women to be back, to be at home, not in the public space, to raise their voice and to participate in the political and community level activities. I find that when you bring those four challenges in place, and I can say in the economic side, getting access to capital getting access to technology getting access to uh, to, to 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 the ecosystem to be able to contribute there by own mind to improve the laws and the policies that i can say that are the main challenges we have now in mali and especially in africa with faith leaders in our community Thank you. Thank you so much, Kasum. Before I go back to you, Sarah, uh, I'm just checking with Sister Veronica if her technical issue is solved or still no. Rachel, can you help me with this if she's okay or? Okay, so back to you, Sarah. And then now we need to end with one minute statement about, I mean, this kind of sustainability. We listened to your initiatives. We've heard about the barriers that might differ from, the, from context to context on many different levels. But if you want to propose solution of, and the audience is listening to us and I can see there are many questions that we address to you now after your statements of how do you think we can help bolster the women's participation and leadership in the workforce? And let's focus on young women. So if you want to propose one solution to uh, uh, empower the young women in workforce, what would be the solution from your perspective? You're muted, Sarah. Yes, I just opened, <laughs> so sorry. I was just listening to your question. So um, I think that the most important way to actually include uh, the, hi, Sister Veronica, we heard you before you left. I was here yeah, yeah. and I sent the message, but I'm you logged sorry. out. No, welcome back, welcome I'm back. Sorry. Welcome back. Um, so I think that in, in, from my own seat, I do believe that holding holding very um, big space for a young woman and for women uh, to actually um, to challenge us. Um, I think that, and we need to be very intentional about this as well. Um, at this moment in time, a lot of uh, a lot of people, a lot of women have forgotten because again, because of the obstacle and challenges that we have been talking about, if it's educational, religious, cultural, tribalism, et cetera, of all the challenges that we talked about and we didn't talk about, if we can actually hold a space and be intentional in that space that we create for women to actually uh, be who they want to be and how who they can be, I think this is the best and the first step um, in, in the change making process in the fact in the, in the way of and it, to create that space for um, uh, like uh, female leadership and uh, to uh, create a, 
like to at least bring equity to the to the equation thank you dr sarah uh, so from the big space for women leadership Suraya, what would be your solution for young women in one minute you're muted again thought, yeah my solution my solution i think is prioritizing women's access to employment is the first step but mostly uh, a war leads to poverty and poverty leads uh, that usually women are the people who pay the biggest price or the biggest ticket. So we need to enlist faith actors to fight inhibitors like uh, child marriages, which usually the women uh, families marry girls early while uh, like, for example, Syrian uh, women in normal situation were given longer time at home, education, they were married at a later age. We see that this is changing now. So we need to uh, enlist the moderate faith actors from all the factions so that they fight the extremism and so that they fight for the right of women to continue to be part of the education process, of the economic process, and to continue to be, to be uh, uh, major role players in, in the economy and in the politics. So, thank you so I believe. Much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Thuraya, back to you, Sister Veronica. I mean, your line was cut, and we were asking about your statement in one minute for your proposal for, I mean, how can you, in your opinion, offer one solution for women participation and leadership in workplace? What do you think is the best solution, especially for young women? to enhance their participation in workplace? Well, I, I think first of all, they need to be empowered educationally. They need to be empowered because for them to work efficiently, they need to have proper training they need. And the environment should be friendly, not hostile environment because that discriminate against them because they are women. Their rights must be respected and they should be paid well as they pay their male counterparts. Because most of the time they don't pay them well because they are women. Um, also, they, uh, when it comes to maternity, they should be considered maternity leave. Most of the time, private sectors don't give them enough maternity leave. In Europe, they get six months when they give birth. But here in Africa, Nigeria, because most of the women work with private sectors, they don't get that privilege, that opportunity to be with their children. Thank you so much, sister. And the same for you, Kasum. What solution would you like to add for these diversity of solutions? You're muted. Kasum, you're muted again. Oh, sorry, okay. sorry. Uh, my only solution is that we need to bring young women agriculture and food uh, systems in Africa. Because when we will be able to feed Africa by African young Muslim women and women in general, we can be able to bring peace and sustainable development. And for that, we need to educate young women in entrepreneurship. Because this education begins from when we are a child to become, um, more, you know, to become more, more women. This education process can lead them to become good employees. We can lead them to have access to, to land, access to finance, access to technology, and to facilitate the fair environment that we can develop a own businesses. I think that this is for me the best solution that we can bring to young women uh, to get them access to agriculture and entrepreneurship in agriculture sector to bring food for peace in Africa. Thank you so much. And I really, really, really wish we had more time to hear for more for such an inspiring uh, um, interventions and, and people who are really on the ground and they have really empowered, uh, like they have long history of working in this field. And we understand that without the inclusion of half of the world population is unlikely to reach solution for our sustainable earth. I mean, would like to hear now from a group of Q&A questions. Rachel, if you're going to help me with the questions that really addressed. So to check the answer, the some of the questions. 
Yes, let me pull up the questions for you here now. So I'll start with the first question and I'll um, send you the rest in the chat. Okay. So, so the first question would be, any ideas on how to contribute to post-conflict reconstruction efforts? Does somebody want to answer this question until we? Sister Veronica unmuted, so I don't wanna, uh, if you wanna answer this, Sister Veronica. Sister Veronica, you wanna answer this question? You're muted, Sister Veronica. Go ahead first. I wanted to say something that has passed, sorry. Uh, okay. Go, go ahead. Okay, so sorry. Yep. So I think that uh, the to contribute to the post conflict reconstruction is to actually um, work together. I do believe that a lot of actors who are um, working in silos and in different um, in different area, if they actually work together, the impact will look much different. Um, I think also when we are looking at post-conflict uh, re reconstruction, uh, we are looking at uh, totally, in some cases, in most cases, uh, totally destructed and uh, destructed uh, communities and, and places. And if we are thinking that if the, the intervention, I think, needs to be a long-term intervention, and that's why where the efforts, collective efforts actually come together um, and that's why I say we can help each other because some actors can help on relief, emergency needs, etc. But I do believe that if we are focused on more sustainable solution and that way we are mostly contributing to the uh, post uh, conflict reconstruction. But ha holding Thank hands you. is the best. Uh, Thank is you, the best okay. Thank you. Before we move to the question, we'd like to go to Sister Veronica and you would like to add something before. Go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to ask some such challenges before I was cut off by the yes. network. That yes. um, like in Nigeria, the faith actors are having a lot of challenges of insecurity mm. in Nigeria. And it's affecting us in moving up and down, reaching out to the grassroots because of the bandits, the kidnapping going on, especially in the Northern part of Nigeria. So, but what we do is that we try to educate. We, we are having what we call mother school. It's not a forward school. School where you bring women, women and young women to uh, educate them on how to listen to their children, on how to know when the child is changing and doing other things, to always monitor their children through the conflict trainings we give them and other trainings. It's a, a whole model, uh, model of uh, over 10 contents to educate them on that. Because we need that. Now, most women don't pay attention to their children. And because of some of the challenges they too are having as mothers, you know, like mothers are into drugs now because of some of these harmful uh, practices. They are forced into marriage. They, they, they don't love the man and they are there and they cannot go. So some of them go into drug to solve their problem and children are learning from them. So we educate them on that so that there'll be a better society. And when they, you give birth to the number of children you can cater for, instead of leaving them on the street begging all in the name of our magic or religion, which is common in the West Africa, Islamic religion, not all over the world. Hmm. Thank you, Sister Veronica, for these valuable highlights for the changes and then how much the insecurity really affects. And there is one question Erlang would like to take, like how are faith actors uniquely positioned to advance women's economic empowerment? So the question is about faith actors and how we can engage more faith actors and communities uh, in these. And maybe there's one link questions about the government's impact too. So would you like, go ahead, Threya. So the question is about like engaging more faith actors and you've pointed a lot of the, your intervention about faith actors. Yes. I think I will I will take this because it was actually the 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 idea where I stopped. So I will yes. just continue with the idea that in war torn regions and conflict regions and poverty stricken areas, 
the role of faith actors becomes very uh, important and very primary. People tend to revert more to faith when in crisis. We need uh, the, the, and the faith actors are very visible. Uh, people when in, in war torn areas, clearly there is no trust in governments, there is no trust in politics and the rules are falling apart. So only system that is still in place is usually the faith. Uh, in, a, in a country like Syria, where there are many uh, factions and many religions, which uh, when the faith actors sit together at the same table, they give the people the idea that they too can sit at the same table. They provide the role models and people are looking uh, to their faith uh, presenters like Christians to their church, Muslims to their uh, sheikhs. They wanna see what they're doing to give them the guidelines. I think uh, we as Tastaqil have uh, worked together and have enlisted the help of amazing, amazing faith actors who helped us debuckle a lot of the stigma around the role of women and what women can do. They fought side, uh, beside us against the extremists who said that women should not be out of their house, they shouldn't work, they shouldn't get more education. And I think they affected a lot of change much faster than any other presenter can, could have helped us with. So I think, yes, faith actors are uniquely positioned to advance women economic empowerment because they are the people, the voice people listen to in conflict stricken areas. And if you can enlist faith actors to be on your side, then you've already won half of the battle. Thank you so much. And there is a question related to the government impact. Do you see any kind of support from the government part? Yes, Kasum. Uh, before moving to that question, I want to come to, to the first question about how to engage more faith leaders. I think that in our communities, when we see, I think that we need to re-educate or to retrain the faith leaders in how they teach their faith. Because most of the faith leaders in Mali are disconnected to the realities of the community. Or faith leaders are sometimes talking too much about after you are there. I think that people need that to see they are entering a paradise of not. But now they need to solve the reality, the day by day problems. And faith leaders should be not only thinking about after death, but before you death, how you can bring happiness in your life. And to see how they can coach and mentor the population to be the right people who can solve their soul problem in the good ethics. I think that this is something. We need to be clear in how faith leaders have to work in our communities. The second question is about the impact of government. I think that sometimes governments are using faith to, uh, to, 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 to come in the, in the public space when they need it, when they want to manipulate them. I think that faith leaders should not enter in the manipulation of the government because they have to say the truth to the governments who failed to bring, you know, uh, good policies, good laws that can facilitate the life of the community. And that this is something very clear for me that faith leaders should tell the truth to the government who are wrong. If you are a faith leader, you not need to support a wrong government who are killing the population. You have to say that no, you have to stop and to bring the best way people can live their life and to be able to change the narrative in our community. We have that. We cannot do anything positive. Thank you. Thank you, Kasum, and the importance of changing the narratives. And thank you, Dr. Sara, for writing a lot of answers on, on the panelists. That is so kind. There's an important question of what are some concrete things that you see NGOs based in the global north can do to show solidarity with and support and advance in the role of women of faith in the global south working in conflict and post-conflict settings? So the role of Global North in solidarity uh, with the women of faith in the South. I don't know would would like to take part in, in this. So we'd like like hear quickly from Sarah and Kasum. I don't know, uh, Sister Veronica, if you want to add or go ahead. Yeah, or for, for me, 
In addition, um, the Global South should support the in ensuring that policies, they can add their voice in policy making, support those who are into police, policy so that they will know they are not alone, that they have backup of the system. We are one global family. Wherever we are, we should support others, show that support policy, back them up, whether financially or otherwise so that they know because when we pull our synergies together, we'll be able to achieve it. We cannot do it alone. Exactly, Dr. V uh, Sister Veronica, that's why the injustice anywhere affect the justice everywhere. Yes. Uh, what would you like to add, Sarah? Uh, thank you, Dr. Khulud. I think that uh, like, uh, <laughs> the Global North has a lot of problems of their own that they need to advocate for <laughs> before actually being able to um, make sure that the, the, the South is, is, is supported. However, I do believe that uh, like uh, refinement of global and foreign policies is really a major uh, thing in uh, creating some kind of change. I do believe that, I know that some of the comment was about the UN support. I do believe that the, a lot of actors, especially when it comes to the UN agencies is, um, is mainly targeting is mainly targets the uh, like where is where the conflict is where the hype is where is the eyes of the global uh, like the global vision is so if it is like if it's today Ukraine tomorrow it will be somewhere else so sometimes certain I is certain visions and certain path is overseen by other emergencies that are emergent every single day uh, so I do believe that uh, change in, in foreign policies and some kind of always shedding the, the light on the importance of um, sustainable development and, and empowerment of economies, empowerment of women, and supporting actual supporting actual local actors who actually change makers that are lobbying for certain kind of change is is in some way can be considered as a like concrete ways or things to support to show solidarity with um, with with the people in different in different. Uh, scenarios and in different locations in the world. Thank you, Suraya. And I would like to hear also from, uh, thank you, Sarah, Dr. Sarah. We'd like to hear also from Suraya and Kasum on this before we go to the, our final statement. Yeah, uh, I have just one, one small thing. I noticed that I know the question said global, but I also want to say that uh, sometimes much smaller than global makes a huge difference. When you make small partnerships, city to city, town to town, even organization to organization, you can create a synergy of change that is much bigger than the small partnership. So achieving partnerships between the North and the South, achieving between uh, that creates a different perspective, gives a broader image to the women we're trying to educate about what are the possibilities. It educates both, it educates both sides actually. And it's a great tool about learning about each other, about coming together. So attracting and promoting partnership between the North and the South to scale up women's role is a great tool that is understated. We always think big, we always think UN, big rules are changing the policies. There are hundreds of policies that are not being followed. One small initiative makes a huge difference in a certain community and then the ripple effect can be great. And that's why Eliana Roosevelt on the uh, statement of the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights say, there is no place for human rights if it doesn't start with our small circles in our houses, in our schools, in every small house. It doesn't matter there, it doesn't matter everywhere. So Kasum, yes. what, what would you like to, to add? I want to add that uh, we, we, we need uh, equal, equal cooperation, like uh, global South or North women, she she's see each other as equal. I think that this is important. Uh, in that partnership, we need to, to, to have a dialogue a clear dialogue on what we, what we want to build around the world. And if the Global North have solidarity with uh, Global South, and especially in Africa, 
I think that also African women and young women are also solutions that can bring to the global north. It's the both sides, not only to, from north to, to south, but think about south to north. This is something, something we are missing in our uh, minds and, uh, and when we talk about partnership. The second thing is about uh, how we can work to have a common agenda, okay, in the next mm -hmm. decade or the next uh, two, two, two which are coming uh, next. I think that this is very important because mm -hmm. Africa is the future. Africa has at, at least 600 million young women in play. That is the future. They are energy. We have some issues about SRHR and also they can bring power, energy, and new ideas to transform the world in the next century. And I think now a woman should take in consideration where they are designing and planning things for the world. And I think that in partnership with an equal position, we can bring peace and sustainable development in the world. Thank you, Kasum. I'm really so much inspired with all of these uh, experiences and visions that I'm hearing today. And if I ask uh, each one of my respective colleagues on the panelists, on the panelists. Uh, just your final tweet. So, uh, Dr. Sara, if you are tweeting your, your, your intervention today with a final statement, what would it be? A tweet, so it's short, just a last tweet. That's so hard to tell you in the on the spot. A tweet needs to be thought of, especially if you want it to be a click bite and go on a tweet. <laughs> but I would just say that empowered women, empower women. And if we are actually, and the first step of uh, empowering economy is actually having, um, opening the space for uh, women to be part of it. Thank you so much, uh, Thraya. I think I, I would go with a tweet I, I made or a statement I made for the Women's uh, Day a couple of days ago, and I go, empowered women make the world a better place. So let's empower the women. It's our only way to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And uh, Sister Veronica. <laughs> let's continue to empower women ensure that they are qualified, equipped, and result-oriented for any position they aspire to. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Kasun. I can say when we empower women, we empower our communities. And the faith leaders should be at the front of the thinking and the action, and to bring more men and boys on conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I would like uh, to take this opportunity to, th to thank you all and uh, to wish, uh, I mean, to say happy Women's Day for all of the women around the world. To all the young girls, believe in yourself and reach all your full potentials. And I would leave the mic to Rachel and Eli. And thank you so much. And thank an you apologies, so much. I have you. sometimes to set up the intervention just because of the time. So please accept my apologies. <laughs> Thank it's you. all right. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Kalud, so much. and thank you so much to all of our panelists. I just want to note that this um, this conversation has been recorded, um, and as we said in the beginning, it will be available on both the Network for Religious and Traditional Peacemakers and Tana Bob's YouTube pages and websites. Thank you so much to everyone. I wish you a wonderful evening and a great um, CSW. We have two wonderful weeks left ahead with lots of great events, so thank you so much uh, for your participation. Have have a wonderful evening and afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. All. Have a great um, Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Great Bye -bye. opportunity.